Man, why do all these new releases always have to happen around my birthday? I swear I haven't had a non-working birthday weekend in years. But hey, it's worth it for videos like this where I get to play around with the flagship of AMD's new 800 series chipset, the X870E. And more specifically, the absolute bonkers Asus ROG Strix X870E-E gaming Wi-Fi. And if it feels like we've been waiting a while for these new boards, it's because we have. Even though these boards are best paired with AMD's latest uh, Ryzen 9000 series chips, those launched about a month ago. So what gives? Well, I don't know. But what I do know is that the boards are finally here, and it's time to see whether their relatively long wait has been worth it. Or whether this is just another refresh that no one asked for. But first, a word from me. If you want to support the channel and the work I do here, just keep watching. Or if you want to grab any of the products mentioned in any of my videos, feel free to use my affiliate links in the video description. So if you've been following along with the news about AMD's new chipset lineup, you'll know that the 800 series doesn't seem to bring all that much new to the table, especially regarding the flagship models. The X870, X870e, and the last gen hero X670e all feature the same PCIe 5.0 support, with 1x16 or 2x8 configurations for the GPU, with additional 5.0 lanes for high-speed NVMe drives, along with four general purpose lanes. The X870e and X670e even share the same number of total usable PCIe lanes, due to both having a dual-chip architecture. The only major difference, or at least the only one I care about, between the X870 and X670 that it replaces is that USB 4.0 is now a required standard for boards, rather than an optional add-on. This is a pretty big deal for creators and professionals for obvious reasons. Other than that though, the 800 series chipsets are a little boring. Luckily, the same can't be said for the motherboards they're slotted into, especially not the Strix X870e-e, which is very much not boring. Inside the very demure, very mindful box is the board itself. But first, a quick look at the included accessories. The first of which is an RG branded keychain, Slay, a handy quick start guide with a useful diagram of the board right on the cover, some more documentation, then what we've all been waiting for, stickers. Super shiny and pretty cool stickers, all jokes aside. At the bottom of the box, we have a slick antenna for the board's Wi-Fi 7, yes, friggin' Wi-Fi 7, a bag of goodies including cable ties for cable management, a replacement thermal pad for one of the M.2 heatsinks, two SATA cables, a couple of M.2 rubbers, and finally, an extra Q latch and two Q slide thingies, all of which are found all over the board, and as we'll see in just a bit, make M.2 installation so satisfyingly easy. And now, the star of the show. And, oh lord, I think this is probably the sickest motherboard I've ever held in my hands. The blackout PCB, heat spreaders, and almost all matte black brushed aluminum components are complemented perfectly by printed matte ROG branding with little touches and details everywhere. All while much needed contrast comes in the form of glossy branding on the I.O. cover around the RGB I logo, the big, aggressive, and shiny Strix branding on the chipset heatsink, and then finally the reflective silver metal plate on top of the uh, M.2 slot with the ROG Strix lettering cut into it. I mean, chef's kiss, ROG. And here, ROG, take another quick peck for remembering the RGB fanboys like myself. The customizable ROG logo looks awesome set between the new slogan. When lit up, it's just bright enough to not be obnoxious, and is so well diffused that it makes some of my other components look more like toys rather than serious pieces of kit by comparison. If I had to nitpick, I wouldn't have minded another splash of RGB somewhere else on the board, and I can't help but feel like the topmost VRM heatsink could have used a bit more pizzazz similar to the metal plate on the M.2 cooler. But other than that, I legitimately love the design of this board. It looks just as premium as it feels, should fit into any build perfectly, and has more than enough interesting elements dotted throughout to keep it from looking drab. And drab isn't a word anyone could use to describe the important bits of the board either. The Strix X870e-e is a beast when it comes to pretty much everything else too. This is an ATX motherboard and a pretty bulky and heavy one too. Just by hand weighing the thing, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't like a kilogram of metal stuck to this thing. It's also a really sturdy board, thanks to said metal and premium feeling components. Breaking anything on this board, minus the CPU socket obviously, would be almost as impressive as it would be heartbreaking. Speaking of the CPU socket, this is an AM5 board and is therefore compatible with all current gen Ryzen 7000 to 9000 series chips. Just note that which chip generation you choose to go with will dictate your support for certain features like M.2 support, so be sure to check out the product link in the description for additional details. The board features four DDR5 memory slots up to a max of 192GB and when paired with a 9000 series Ryzen chip should be able to handle speeds of up to 8000 mega transfers per second. ROG claims that their new NitroPath DRAM tech, with shorter pins and better pathways implemented into the board, can help improve speeds by about 400 megatransfers per second. 
and they've even fiddled around with the mounting hardware to improve retention force as a nice little bonus. An exceptionally bigger bonus comes when we take a look at the board's storage support. Along with four SATA ports, which yes, people like me still need those, RG has stacked this board with M.2 slots. The three main slots are wired to the CPU with support for PCIe 5.0, while the two at the bottom are wired to the chipset and support PCIe 4.0, making for five total expansion slots. I don't even have that many M.2 drives. Now, as I mentioned before, all the slots are topped with dedicated heatsinks, and the top three feature the biggest of the bunch. The first two slots share a block of a heatsink that even has a heat pipe running through there somewhere, while the slot to the right has an even taller chunk of metal keeping it cool. Top of the line 5.0 drives do get mighty toasty under heavy load, but even so, I feel like this is major overkill. And while great cooling is, well, cool, surprisingly, it's what's underneath the bulky heat sinks that blew me away. A big part of this board's appeal, as you'll see, is ease of installation, and nowhere is that more apparent than when you mount an M.2 on this board. To get at that primary M.2 slot, all you have to do is press the little button next to the heat spreader, and the whole thing just kind of pops off. And the geeking out doesn't stop there. All of the M.2 slots come equipped with what RG calls Q latches, also known as little plastic latches that you just press your M.2 into to snap it into place and push the latch back to remove it. Even mounting drives with less common form factors is a breeze too, thanks to Q slide, another plastic thingy that slides onto the slot and secures the drive wherever you need it to. And those aren't the only quality of life features RG added to the board. There's also stuff like the Q code display and Q LED for troubleshooting, dedicated start, flex key, clear CMOS and BIOS flashback buttons, which are a godsend for reviewers like me. Then we have Q antenna, basically a system that lets you plug Wi-Fi antennas in and out without the hassle. And then finally, a feature I only learned about after I finished my uh, most of my work with the board, Q release slip, a silly name for yank your graphics card out, bro. Unlike what I'm doing in this B-roll, firmly hold the board in place and lift your GPU out IO side first, and it pops out. Magic. And sticking with the theme of making my life easier, the board includes a perfectly utilitarian rear I.O. panel. Taking full advantage of the new USB 4.0 requirement, the board features two USB 4 ports capable of the full 40 gigabit per second standard, along with a 20 gig Type-C port with 30 watt fast charging, and a total of 10 additional USB 10 gig ports, one of which is Type-C. Other notable additions include an HDMI port, a 5 gigabit Ethernet jack, audio jacks including an optical port, the Wi-Fi 7 module, and then the aforementioned BIOS splashback and clear CMOS buttons. And if you need even more ports to plug things into, the board has a ton of internal connectors. I won't be listing them all, but shout out to the five case fan headers along with the usual CPU fan and AIO headers, the USB 20 gig connector, and the three addressable RGB headers. Now, before we fire the board up and see how it actually performs, we've got to talk about power delivery. Even the most power hungry new Ryzen chips are super efficient, but even so, ROG decided to slap an 18 plus two plus two VRM onto this thing. That's a heck of a VRM solution that's even more ridiculously overkill, considering that ROG is using 110 amp power stages. Not even with the most advanced overclock would I ever expect to run into power issues on a board like this. And speaking of power, let's get this thing powered on. Now, as we get into performance testing, it's worth noting that tests were run on Windows 11 24H2 from the Insider Preview, and I used the latest BIOS version available with the AGISA uh, 1.2.0.2 update. It's also worth keeping in mind that AMD and board partners have been rolling out updates that let users easily switch to more aggressive 105 watt TDPs for the Ryzen 9000 series chips. And as far as I understand, doing so is covered under warranty. Along with that, RG is leaning heavily into AI features for this board. And while I wasn't able to test them all, I found the AI optimized core ratio feature to be super simple to use and proved to be a big performance boost. I'll be including results for both of these features where indicated. The system used for testing starts with the board itself, a 32 gig kit of Kingston's Fury Beast DDR5 running at 6000 MHz CL32, Cooler Master's ML240 AIO, an RX 6900XC from MSI, Crucial's P5 Plus as our main drive, and Antec Signature 1000 watt power supply. Okay, let's get into it. And as you can see, I tested three chips on the board, including the 7700X, the 9700X, and I also tossed in the 7800X 2D in there just to get us all hyped for the 9000 series X 2D chips. You'll also notice that I used the AI overclocking feature for both of the non X 2D chips and enabled the 105 watt TDP setting for the 9700X. It's in the productivity workloads where we see the overclock and increased TDP come in clutch, especially so for the 9700X, which just barely nudges out the 7700X without it but pulls well ahead of it when those are applied. 
The overclock raised the 9700 access scores in these productivity tests by 4% up to an impressive 20%. RG's AI overclock also pushes the older chip ahead by several notches. Similar to most productivity workloads, Unigen Superposition and 3D Mark Time Spy aren't tests that appreciate extra vCache, so the overclock 9700X easily takes the win here. Moving on to gaming benchmarks, I won't be digging into all 18 of them since we're testing the motherboard here and not the individual chips, but it took days to get all this data, so I'm including it anyway. And as expected, the 7800X3D still reigns supreme when it comes to gaming, losing only in one or two games that didn't seem to care at all about CPU performance. What's more interesting are the games where the overclocked versions of both the 77 and 9700X saw significant FPS boosts compared to stock. Keeping in mind that getting that extra performance boost only took less than a minute in the BIOS and turning one or two settings on, that's impressive stuff. I mean, in a lot of those cases, the overclock 9700X comes within spitting distance of the X3D. It leaves me with no doubt that with the proper know-how, you could easily dial in a much more aggressive overclock on this board and get way more impressive results than shown here. Or you could dig into some of the board's other AI OC features if you want to skip the legwork. I'm legitimately excited to see how far some of you can push a board like this. Anyway, with all the averages added up, the AI overclock 7700X saw a 3.7% boost over stock, while the 9700X saw a very similar 3.6% boost. And again, this is with basically zero effort. It also meant that the overclock 9700X came within 3% or so of the X3D. During testing, the overclock 9700X with that race CDP was the most power hungry of all the chips tested, drawing a max of 142 watts during gaming. A teensy bit more than the 7700X and way, way less than a board like this is capable of. While all that was going on, the hottest the dual chipset ever got was around 59 degrees. And even though my monitoring wasn't able to capture the VRM temps, from what I've heard from other reviewers, those are impressive too. All in all, Asus RG has delivered a board that surpasses almost all of my expectations. When I first saw the specifications for the 800 series chipset, I was a bit disappointed. And to some degree, I still sort of am. The chipset itself, with the only major headliner for me being USB 4, isn't very exciting. But then board partners come along and add more than a dash of spice to make things more interesting. The ROG Strix X870E Gaming Wi-Fi is an exceptional piece of kit that does just that. It looks phenomenal, it's packed with extremely useful features and quality of life upgrades, and it has more performance up its sleeve than most of us would ever need. The only potential sticking point here is something I've just realized I haven't even talked about. Price. And on that front, I'm not nearly as surprised as I thought I'd be. As of right now, you can pick up one of these boards for about $500 or 12,800 Rand here in South Africa. <laughs> and yes, that's a lot for a motherboard. I'm still one of those people who thinks anything more than 200 bucks for a board is too much. But the reality is that AIM-5 boards have always been on the pricey end of things, even for the more budget-oriented boards. And this and most other X870E boards are not budget-oriented boards. They're premium products with premium aesthetics, premium features, and potentially premium performance. And as such, I don't think the pricing here is too far off the mark. I mean, it's not even much of a premium over the X670E version of the board, which can currently be had for around $440. Of course, if you already have a great 600 series board, the value proposition just isn't here for you. Performance-wise, you shouldn't expect any notable uplift from moving to the 800 series. But if you're planning a new build, a particularly gorgeous one at that, could really benefit from USB 4 or Wi-Fi 7 and have a relatively flexible budget, then boards like the Strix X870E Gaming Wi-Fi should be at the top of your list. And that does it for this one. Thanks for watching, and remember to buy all of your things using my affiliate links below to support the channel. And yeah, I'll see you all in the next one. Cheers.